bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. We are live. This is us. We're live. We're all here. This is BIM thinking. Or BIM thoughts. It's BIM thoughts, really. But we could be BIM thinking today. It's thinking when we start. It's thoughts when we're done. Okay. I like that. I like that. That that was Carl. The Carl Storms. The BIM cider himself. And uh, I think that was an official drink one year. BIM cider. (laughs) It was. It was. It was whatever cider you could find and then just put BIM in front of it. And then we have the Dana de, de, uh, oh, come on, de Philippi. Has it been like a year? It's been like more than a year. See, it's been, it's been a long time. Did we have an official drink with you? Not yet. Not Maybe yet. Too. Next year. Next year, when we all get to go somewhere again, we will have an official drink. And we have Alex Quarter, did I do that right? That's right, yep. It's a miracle. Well done, I'm, Bill. I'm, I'm just horrible with names. Horrible, I say. So, Alex, define yourself. That's a loaded question. Um, I know, that's why I ask it. So, I'll start with my sort of background a little bit. Um, I'm from Belgium originally. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, I kind of grew up in Belgium and then did all my schooling in the UK, north of England, Manchester, and then went to Glasgow School of Art um, to kind of do do graduate degree up there and then worked in London for five years um, and then joined co-architects here in LA in 2005. So I've been here 16 years uh, almost. My uh, my wife's from Minneapolis. I met her when we when I was doing a, an internship actually in Minneapolis for a year. Um, mm-hmm. Loved the place. We met, and that was it. Um, it's been you know been together ever since. And so we moved out here because she she came to London, and then uh, she's more in the movie business. And um, sort of we moved mm-hmm. out here for that. Um, but also coming from Belgium, north of England, Glasgow, Scotland, rainy, grey, all the time. Um, yeah, you know, when she like said you want to go to the beach, you, yeah, exactly. You want to go somewhere <laughs> sunny by the beach? I'm like, sure, let's go. Um, let's go. So that's a that's a little bit of my sort of background. Great. So what do you do at CO Architects? So I'm principal now, co here. Um, like I said, been here 16 years. So I work mm-hmm. on all typologies. I mean, the firm does um, a lot of institutional work, healthcare work, um, academic work. Um, I sort of bounce around. I'm not um, typology sort of specific. Uh, I kind of have done it all. And then I also lead um, the building sort of facades group a little bit, sort of an initiative that we have in the office to sort of push building envelope work, building envelope performance, um, quality, both internally and externally, um, looking for sort of reclad projects as well as just helping any projects we have in the office to kind of push that. Um, and push the envelope, as, as we say. Push the envelope. Yeah. Well, tell us how you're pushing the envelope. Um, I mean, my, my approach is generally um, that I, I like to let performance drive design. I think mm-hmm. um, where mm-hmm. we are in the world, what we've done to this planet, we kind of have to go take that approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it makes just as interesting, if not more interesting, architecture and design um, and provides design solutions. So my approach is kind of to let let the performance actually drive where we go, um, and then you know use technology and digital technology as much as we can, but with with meaning and purpose. Not just because we can, not just because we have the tool, but because it's actually going to bring something. It's actually going to tell us something new, tell us something different. Um, so, and then I also think that innovation and sustainability is not exclusive of any budget. I think it can be done, be done for the smallest budgets as well as the biggest oh, budgets. Yeah. Um, So those are some of the sort of my, I I would say, driving sort of approach to any project. Um, That's kind of the the take uh, that I try and instill on on projects that I'm involved in. Yeah, at uh, firm I'm at LPA, we we really took or taking the 2030 challenge quite seriously. And we have a lot of projects that are 2030 last year and this year too. And yeah, we're finding that we can fit a lot of that stuff within budget get it done on budget and on time and still meet some of those challenge criteria and get some greener buildings out there. Yep. So 
a wonderful thing. I think it's also, you know, a lot of it just takes a little thinking in the beginning, a little strategy and a little mm -hmm. goal setting. Um, and once you've got those things right. in motion, it's a lot easier to get there rather than kind of go so far into the design and then think about, mm -hmm. oh, we should re be more sustainable. It's, that, that's going to be difficult. But. Right. That and um, getting the firm behind you or the, the firm behind that kind of thinking is very important. Without the firm behind you, you can't get, you can't get any traction. You can just be one, one person saying, hey, we're going to do 2030. But if the firm's not behind you, you're not going to be able to get that done. Well, and the client yeah. too, right? Right. Absolutely. They're paying those the bills. Those clients. <laughs> yeah, they're paying the bills. And sometimes it's not, it's not mm -hmm. high on the list, right? So it's, um, right. it's, you know, it's, then you sort of say, okay, do, do we just do it anyway? <laughs> you know, and it shouldn't right. cost them any more money, but that's kind of tough. But at the same time, I think you're right, Bill. And, mm -hmm. you know, getting sort of the performance sustainability approach to the, to the capital D design table to make sure that it's right up there with the contextual approach, the sort of materials, the sort of function mm -hmm. um, that's, that takes some internal sort of, rethinking and retooling it does it does so what uh, softwares and things do you like and do you use tell us more this is a bim podcast but by, by the way yeah so the the, the one <laughs> thing is that it's uh, it's a little bit like music i've noticed that there, there uh -huh. comes a, a point in time where you stop kind of you, your ability to, to absorb new music becomes less and less and less the older right. you get i'm kind of getting mm -hmm. there like um, lizard mcguire so is so yesterday now <laughs> <laughs> similarly to uh, to tools so you know in my role and as my role has evolved i've sort of unfortunately started to tail off in terms of the the, the tools that i can learn so i'm uh -huh. i'm a little bit more a you know a wrangler now i kind of provide parameters and throw ideas sure. out there and uh -huh. uh, and then i let kids go crazy and kind of you know develop tools and do everything that uh -huh. they do that i could never do uh, to be honest so what tool are the cool kids using then so I mean we're still we're still using I mean we're we're Rhino heavy in terms of okay. exploration and analysis yeah. to begin with all mm -hmm. roads lead to Revit I mean documentation goes through Revit so it's it's not atypical but right. we are pretty open ended on the front end in terms of the exploratory mm -hmm. aspects in terms of right. tools to use I mean we're we're dabbling a lot more uh, in in sort of gaming engines and Unity to to create VR AR MR tools but also just interactive tools with clients and so that that's starting to emerge i think we're starting to use them more um less a sort of research yeah hey we can try this out let's see what works it's uh, we've actually started to really implement them as tools for decision making to come up with better solutions with clients and interact with clients in a meaningful way it's taken quite a few rounds because it's really difficult you really have to gauge the client how willing to engage they are um, right. how big the groups are who's going to make the decisions and the tool really needs to cater to that. Um, so mm -hmm. we've, we've kind of been dabbling in that, but it's offered a lot more opportunities than sort of, I would call it more static tools. Um, and so, yeah, Rhino and all its plugins. I mean, we're, you know, for analysis in the Ladybug, Diva, Honeybee um, kind of world, um, we kind of use that a lot. Um, obviously we're, we're running things through Grasshopper. Dynamo is, you know, every now and again, we're not heavy Dynamo users, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, we like it. It's growing more, but um, mm -hmm. haven't been as much. And we've dabbled in Katia, to be honest, and uh, and kind of, mm. um, you know, uh, but we found we love the idea. We want to take it on. It's expensive. But uh, the problem we have is that we don't have the audience at the back end yet. And the, oh. the real benefit is to, to find that partner that's actually going to take it from design through fabrication and construction. And I feel like if you don't have that, or if it's not guaranteed, that tool somewhat falls apart. I mean, we can we can do all the design iterations we want. Katia is not a great documentation tool yet. It's uh, I think it's getting better for a digital pro uh, project, but um, but I think it's important that you have that audience. You basically have that you know who's going to receive all this information. What are they going to do with it? If you don't have that, then half the benefit is kind of gone. Um, yeah. So I think I need that on a shirt. All roads lead to Revit. All roads lead to Revit. All roads. Yeah. Right now they do. Yeah. What about what yeah. about Rhino and inside bridges. Revit? Have you played it at all with that? With the advancements that McNeil has made with, with some of the Rhino inside improvements? 
Yeah, we're starting to mess with that. Um, we still find it clunky, to be quite frank. Um, it's, you know, it's still kind of trying to fit, you know, kind of square peg round hole kind of thing a little bit. So, you know, people still rather go like, okay, now that interoperability exporting of models is actually, you know, I've seen it improve quite a bit. I think, you know, um, we've kind of cracked the Revit nut a little bit and we found workarounds to just get, get, you know, more models, more softwares to talk to one another. Um, you know, the, the sort of in Revit things are, they're better, they're good, but we're using very focused and limited plugins and tools to be quite frank. Um, you know, we're, you know, not, we still don't really shape and rev it at all, to be honest. We've just found that it's it's just very time consuming and generally doesn't get you the result um, in the end. Unless you're making cows or something like that. But... Yeah, exactly. Rhinos. Yeah. Well, we'd Rhinos, love to see yeah. anything that you'd have yeah. to show us if you want to um, share your screen. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to share a couple of things here. Let's Great. see and make sure that this works. Um, I hope it works. Yeah, it's just been a little slow, to be honest, on my end, and I'm not sure why that is. I decided to go to the office to make sure that connectivity was going to be better, yeah. but um, that's not always the case either. <laughs> So the you while well, you're firing up the the hamsters there on the back end to get everything up ready to share, you were mentioned that you kind of found Rhino inside a little bit clunky. Um, do you think that's more coming from a place of being you know high powered grasshopper and high powered Rhino users by themselves? Is there anybody in the office that's not a user that takes advantage of that? Same as you know Dynamo Player for those people that don't do Dynamo. Um, are you finding any use for them, or or again is everybody more suitable in their own environment? I think you touch on something, Carl, that I think everybody's just used used to just going straight into Rhino and kind of just going from there. And, and like I said, we've probably gotten used to sort of developing workarounds um, to then kind of bring it back into Revit, kind of get the geometries and then, and then remodel what we need to. Um, I do think there's an opportunity. I mean, there's always an opportunity maybe for, you know, somebody like me to get into Revit and actually kind of model and, and Rhino within that rather than diving into Rhino altogether. But um, I think, I think you're right. I think there's a little bit of both of those. It's just kind of comfortable. You, you deal with what you know and the, teal, the tools, you know, and I think we're all, we're all human and learning new things are not, it's not always the easiest. Um, Very true. So, well, yeah, you you so said you have a lot of the kids you have doing the stuff for you. What are they learning in schools these days? What do they, what do they, you know, what do they want to do? What, what types of programs do you see them wanting to gravitate towards? Um, I mean, we're still, I'm not really seeing sort of that much um, different from, from the Rhino world, to be honest. I think, um, I think better users, actually better tools, um, sort of more in depth use of Rhino. Um, can't say I've seen sort of personally, you know, a lot of new software pop up, at least for people we've hired and kind of people involved here. Um, like I said, I think the application becomes becomes a little difficult. It's sort of, um, there might be the exploratory aspect of, it, of school of being able to use it, but then, you know, sometimes it doesn't always translate into the professional environment, as you, as you call it. Sometimes it's it's something that's cool. It's something that's nice. It's something that you can research, but then when it gets to well, what's the value? What's how did what's the application to the project? How are you going to really kind of make it useful and work? Um, that sometimes doesn't always translate. Um, you know, it's um, but we we try and think a lot about that. I mean, we, we we're a firm that really doesn't want to box anybody in. Uh, I, I think we want to we want everybody to use their, the tools that are going to make the most effective, that are going to add the most to the project. Um, but as I mentioned, we still need to provide documents at the end, right? That's still our contract. It's still specs and drawings, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the day it says models, uh, you know, only then, uh, you know, we can talk, but that's still not the case, unfortunately. Uh -huh. um, so the any screen sharing in, seems to be spinning, sorry. Um, any playing in informant by chance? Not that I know of, uh, very possible, um, but I, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I, I keep, 
I feel like if if Autodesk really wants them to you know, to get adoption across the industry, we need to get it in schools. All right, we need to get students learning it. Like you're saying, we need to get the, the young kids, the the kids that are coming out of the schools, actually knowing how to do it and knowing how to, you know, to be as fast in Rhino. Right, because Rhino is big in schools. Yeah, I mean, this is. A project that's pretty dear to my heart. I mean, I worked on it for eight years. It's at Cal Poly uh, Pomona. I'm just, you know, here east of LA and it's a student services building. And um, we sort of worked on this, took eight years just because it went on hold a couple of times. But the idea here really was, was really sort of this, this umbrella. Uh, Pomona's hot. Um, so the roof is really the design idea. It was to create shade and shelter, uh, tie it to the hills in the background. Um, and then, you know, uh, make it this, this, this really high performing, low EUI, low energy use building, uh, mainly office building, but it's where students go to register to get financial aid, et cetera. And then everybody from the president down is, is also located in the building. Um, so they wanted so the fancy order, building. Yeah. So in order, <laughs> so, so this was budgeted. That's why I kind of mentioned the budget because budgeted 2010, we ended up finishing construction 2018. The, the budget was never escalated up. So we, we basically finished the project on $2010. Um, but, but really going back to sort of this idea of, a, to me, the most complete application of digital tools and BIM here was starting with the initial sort of defining the shape. I mean, the shape is purely defined by the solar shading on the glass on the vertical surfaces uh, edges are pulled from the glass in south southeast southwest um, exposures and, and tucked in on northern exposures um, you know the waviness is you know to get sort of all the equipment under there fit the program under there get some uh, skylights in there and uh, and we did a lot of analysis in rhino this was where we we sort of used rhino a lot used ladybug a lot used diva a lot to kind of look at the shading on the glass, the um, the analysis, all the edges are perforated. So we did a, a perforation analysis to kind of make sure that it's not too hot under there. Um, and then it, it sort of took off because of its complex shape. Then it went into coordination mode. So we have to we we actually use Rhino again to to study hydrology. Where's water going to go? It's a standing seam roof. It's a pretty simple, um, basic material. Uh, but we obviously manipulated, bent it, um, coordinated it with the supporting structure using tools to kind of show deltas between straight elements, curved elements on the roof. Um, and then, you know, also then used um, obviously the Rhino model directly with the fabricator. They actually took our model, um, our geometry and, um, and optimized the panelization on their end. Um, and then we worked back and forth to make sure it works. And from that Rhino model, they then actually um, ex extracted the individual panel geometry. These are 16-inch panels. Um, each panel, there was three types. There's sort of a straight one, a tapered one, and then sort of a, a comp compound curved one. Um, and uh, they extracted geometries. These geometries were directly fed into machines that were brought to site. Uh, the, the machine basically was fed by a metal coil on one end. The geometry was fed into the, the computer on, in the machine and the panels came out and were put on the building directly. And so from analysis, design, fabrication and reduction of construction waste, uh, this was a completely paperless pro process. The, the roof, and you kind of saw the shape in the video was in the set of drawings was one drawing. That was one plan drawing showing the topography. In this case, everything else was done mainly through the Rhino model. And hmm. that went from, from early design all the way through the production of the panel and the installation on the building. So um, that's one where in its purest form, I think the, the use of digital tools kind of permitted to get this done, get this done right, get this done on budget and actually have it perform the way it's meant to perform. Very cool. So one of the other cool things that I saw on the uh, the CoArchitects website, and I'll fire it up here in a minute. If there's a little video, uh, but it's the augmented reality that you did as part of of that particular building. Um, yep. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, that technology, or should I play the video first and then you can talk about the technology? Yeah, I mean, uh, play the video and then I'll I'll just talk to the video um, sure. if that if that works. Um, All right. 
here we go. So this oh, was, uh, um, you know, working with all these institutional clients, we're not always in the room to explain a building, right? And, uh, and they're multi-layered kind of entities, right? They have, they have, you know, a lot of decision makers, different levels. So we wanted to make the building portable and the building design intent and, and ideas portable. And so um, we actually developed this tool, this app in-house and kind of just broke uh. the building up, right? It shows you all the departments, uh, the layout inside. Um, the roof obviously, you know, covers everything. So we needed to pull it apart like that. Um, the concepts of the planning inside where conference rooms are and offices, um, you know, we then added some, you know, ideas about sort of where, you know, different technical aspects are. So um, here it's sort of the, the section of the building and how the roof interacts with, uh, with the building underneath. The renderings we had initially developed to view this, um, we tied those in there um, and really just provided a, a, again, a tool for intended for the client on their end to be able to kind of inside their own organizations explain how how this building is coming together, why things are the way they are, and how we're sort of meeting their needs, um, in case we're not there to explain it, but make it sort of intuitive, easy to use, um, and kind of somewhat clear. So uh, that that was a, a fun exercise, and and I think a very successful thing for them. Um, like I said, um, because meeting with the university president, for example, is something that's that's very difficult to do. So um, there were others that could go and, and kind of show this for a few minutes um, to make sure everything's on track. That's and really neat. So was this uh, strictly app driven or uh, could you put on, you know, could you load this into a HoloLens and go to the site and use the same content or was this more of a, a viewer for the owners? This was more of a viewer. This was, uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't go that far. We considered it. Um, it was kind of a vast site. It's a lot easier to do now, actually. You know, when we developed this, this is a little few years back. Um, I think there are ways we could do that, but we didn't we didn't push it there. Um, mm -hmm. We just kind of wanted to make, like I said, this this kind of portable portable app. And does this um, pull in? You mentioned some of the gaming engines. It was this developed on something like Unity or uh, Unreal yeah. or something like that? This was Unity, uh, our, our sort of, we have a, a, a genius in-house, uh, her name's Nasli, and uh, she is just very facile with, uh, with all of this stuff and, and uh, you know, can program it and is, uh, is a designer, is an architect, but at the same time has this extra toolkit that is, um, is very useful and, and she's, um, she develops a lot of these different tools. And I think actually, if you wanted to play, um, moving a little bit away from this project, um, Carl, uh -huh. um, at the bottom, there were some other tools um, and links to those. Um, one is called a, a budget calculator. Um, I think this might showcase a little bit of the other things that we're starting to push a little bit. So, so Rhino is very much in these sort of design realm and analysis realm. But um, like I said, we're really starting to apply these tools with meaning and purpose to, to not just communicate information to clients, but actually kind of make decisions together, uh, make decisions more quickly. Um, and so um, this, this sort of, there's a few tools we've kind of developed um, that go with that. The, the budget calculator, correct? And that's another yes. Unity tool? Okay, I think I found that's that a, one here. That's a Unity tool and given, um, that's an interactive tool. So um, I'm just gonna talk, but Carl, if you don't mind just clicking. Sure. Basically this, this was a client that had a fixed budget of $130 million, but they wanted a lot out of that building. Uh, they <laughs> out of that budget. They wanted a new building. They wanted additional projects um, that tie things together, that clean things up on campus. So. We basically just developed this tool and said, you know, okay, well, set your sort of soft cost in the left top left corner, um, you know, put them at 20%. That's kind of aggressive, but that can work. Um, let's set a unit rate for a new building at $725 a square foot. That, that's, this was a research lab, so it's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the top right, you can say, okay, you, you need to demo some buildings. You want to relocate some work. Yeah, put that at 10 million. That makes sense. And then, uh, Carl, maybe these connections and backfill, that's sort of connecting you know, doing infrastructure projects, maybe set that at five. Um, and so that told them, okay, your new building basically can now be 122,000, you know, square feet, and it's going to cost you $89 million um, if you want to stick to 130 million max budget for all this stuff. 
and we sent them this and then let them play, right? And we kind of said, okay, um, well, we can take you through this, but um, this was a very simple tool where we just kept talking about all these variables. And instead of going back and figuring them out and then coming back to them with a presentation and saying, okay, we've looked at the next variable, we kind of said, why don't we just do this in the room and <laughs> just have a tool where you can, you know, rough cut, kind of uh -huh. just make a decision on, on what you want to do, how you want to allocate your budget. And that tells us how big this new building needs to be. Wow. Um, and, and so that was, uh, this was done in Unity too. And uh, I think we did a little, little cleaning up just to, to get the graphics right. But, um, uh -huh. but this was simple, but super effective. Um, uh -huh. Super effective. Oh, yeah. Well, Absolutely. and it puts the the power in the the owner or the, or the client's hand. You know, the, everyone always wants everything, um, but when it comes down to actual dollars and cents, and they can adjust a few dials and say, okay, well, maybe we mm -hmm. don't need this because then we can have this, and you know, stay on budget. Everyone everyone's happy. So it's a a really ingenious and, as you mentioned, uh, simple. We'll say simple because you have a a unified mm -hmm. guru in your in your midst. Um, but to put that together and get value out of it, so you know, I think that's a that's a big win. Yeah, this was this was a fun one. Um, you know, as we're chatting, I mean, um, Carl, if you want to hit the the next one, which is the the sort of first virtual OR, um, this gets into now healthcare work, which is um, really important and moving ever faster. I mean, we're 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 working a lot on hospitals and really big hospitals right now, and everybody wants them faster and faster and faster. So. Um, again, making decisions together faster is, is really important. Um, so this, this is sort of the application of, of sort of the VR headsets, um, you know, to, to talk to surgeons, nurses about, um, you know, operating rooms, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, bringing that into sort of the healthcare environment, having the library of all the different um, pieces of equipment that go in there. Um, so that uh, we can basically talk to them about um, how the room should be set up, its capabilities, um, and even you know setting up for different cases for different surgeries. Uh, where do things go? Where do you store things? Um, and sort of having this library of equipment in there that we can then place uh, with them, um, uh -huh. you know, was was really effective too. The challenge here becomes. There are a lot of people involved in this, um, in making these decisions, and um, human psychology still is not always comfortable with the headsets. I mean, um, it, it's getting better; it's kind of becoming uh -huh. more mainstream. But honestly, um, individuals putting on headsets, but then also individuals putting on headsets with others that don't have a headset on. Um, <laughs> there's a weird dynamic sometimes in these kind of meetings. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we end up putting the headsets on and being like the guinea pig and saying, okay, where do you want it sort of thing? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we're more successful. So we realize that we need to be facile because we can't sort of force one way to do it on them. Uh, we're going to need to kind of be a little bit more nimble on how we gather that information. And um, Carl, if you want to play the second one, the OR2, that's sort of an evolution of that um, where we started to kind of... Um, still use the same tools, but then actually kind of hybridize physical models and, and the virtual reality environment. Um, so this was basically, um, you know, version 2.0 of the, of the operating room, having learned from the past um, and the difficulty of interacting with a, a larger group, we actually, you know, ended up building a small little simple model um, uh -huh. and then linking physical elements to virtual elements um, uh -huh. that we could then move around so that a group of 10 people could sit around um, and actually move things physically or virtually. Um, and then we can kind of sort of bring that into an environment bring multiple people into an environment. Um, so we, it wasn't just equipment, it was, it was people as well. Um, and then providing the different sort of angles from who's in there, making it more interactive, making it a little bit more appealing. Um, and then adding some controls as well in terms of, you know, adjusting uh, lighting, um, you know, and, and elements like that. Um, in the, in the room to sort of make it more engaging as well, not just about um, the equipment, but um, also the environment 
um, the glazing maybe that looks into the room, uh, like I said, the lighting, et cetera. So that's really so, cool. So when you were working on this uh, 2.0 version, uh, did the hardware change as well? Like from the first Oculus to the, maybe the Oculus Rift or the hardware is changing versions? so yes, much. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's changing all the time. It's crazy because we're, um, we're now doing this for another project that we're working on right now. And mm -hmm. as good as our digital experience designer is, Nazi, I mean, she's, you know, amazing. She was like, everything's changed. I need to like recode everything. I mean, <laughs> I, I basically need to start from the beginning. You kind of do that anyway. Um, I mean, we've realized because we, we can't take one tool for one client and just apply to the next client. It actually is not that easy. Um, you can take the bones of it. You can take structures of it. But it's, you know, there's different variants, different dynamics that come to play that actually require us to do a lot of retooling, to be honest, of, of even these kind of tools uh, going from project to project, client to client. But yes, I mean, Carl, the, it's moving at such a high pace that, um, you know, we, we have our people that are like, yeah, I was, I was used to this, you know, six months ago, but I need to kind of relearn some things here because they've changed already. The, the gears changed, the way this program's changed, the way I need to approach it has changed. Um, so, so yes, there's, uh, there's constant learning that's happening over here. Well, well and uh, back, in, back in my industry days, way back when, um, I worked on a, a $1.2 billion hospital here in Calgary. And I, I know the headaches of the real mock-ups where we would build actual rooms with all the equipment and it would be a whole entourage that would go there. You would have the, the architecture staff, the engineering staff, the construction staff, all of the doctors and nurses, everybody in this room that was full size out trying to make things. And then we had uh, two people on staff for, uh, for two years and all they did was make the room data sheets that came from those meetings in CAD and then somebody would take yep. them from CAD and translate them into mm -hmm. Revit and we'd go from there. So seeing, I always knew that the VR would help with that situation, but the little bit that you did there with having the physical model, because some people just deal with that better and the way it linked right into the, to the VR was, well, frankly, brilliant. Um, and I'm assuming it's just an overhead camera that's tracking that QR code that brings Correct. it into your, yeah, that's yep. uh that, that's brilliant and it's a lot easier than building you, an entire mini hospital on site yeah you see it on the if you start the video right at the beginning on the on the right hand side you see the little model and it's just got a, a simple just uh you know polar for you know a camera and then it's just looking down onto the model basically um so it's um yeah and it's you know and, it, and this also comes from you know i mean we've been in user meetings like you like you mentioned a long time ago and a lot of people don't read plans i mean even room data sheets are, are great but um you know, we've found that nurses, doctors, some of them, see that's, you can see the model on the right with the camera just right above yeah. it. Um, so, you know, you, a lot of people didn't know how to read plans either. So you you were kind of sort of talking and they were not really engaging. And then these mock-ups, these physical mock-ups are big, they're expensive. You need to find warehouses and spaces for them. Um, you know, they take time. So, so yeah, this is, um, this is definitely helping out with that. Um, and again, I right. think you can run a lot more different scenarios with this a lot quicker. You can go through the iterations so fast um, uh -huh. that it's um, it's a little more productive, effective. Um, so. Well, and, and of course, as we're, we're watching the video here, I think this brings up something else that uh, we all know and love and talk about frequently here on Vim Thoughts is uh, uh, some 3D printer action there to, uh, uh -huh. to create that model. So do you guys, I'm guessing, do that in-house as well? Yeah, we, we have a... a a good model shop. I mean, we're, we're printing, we have a couple of sort of maker bots. We have a, um, you know, a, a powder printer. That's what we use mainly. Um, I mean, you won't see behind me, but there's a, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, boxes around cause we're actually moving office. Um, so, you know, we're, um, we're going to have a bigger model shop. So we're kind of looking at what that capacity is, but uh, right now using it like this to make tools, um, and we've actually kind of expanded um, this kind of hybridized, you know, digital and physical modeling um, on on a, quite a few things now that, that we just build simple box geometries and then and then we've projected now facade options onto a simple model to kind of bring it to a client. You know, um, we've done that um, just because we had a facade that was sort of kinetic that kind of flows in the wind. And it's like, how do you render that? That's like, you know, it, it will never come across. So we kind of built a big model, projected this, 
but actually projected a movie, right? That kind of shows the wind kind of going across, so everything was moving. And, and, uh, and it's sort of been interesting to start heading into this world where you start to combine old school, new school, you know, computational and kind of, you know, craft, um, you know, and it's, um, that, that's where, that's, that to me gets really interesting. That, that to me is where the sort of innovation is, uh, is to start to kind of mix these things together. Well, it's, it's funny that uh, you say that. Um, last week, we were talking with uh, Wesley Ben from the Digital Built Environment Institute. Uh, and that was one of the things that he sort of said is that when we went from, from hand drafting to CAD, it was just a digital pencil. Um, and when we moved from CAD into BIM, a lot of us at the start, we kind of took it that way. But now that we're a little farther into BIM and we understand the process, the the joy and the idea behind being a craftsman or a craftswoman or a craftsperson and, and bringing that stuff in and understanding the reality behind building a building, building that lovely facade and roof. How does that work? Um, the tools now allow us to think that way and create that way. So it's not just knowing a software now, it's knowing that craft behind it that really you know empowers you to do what you need to do. And I think it's, it's with everything. I mean, honestly, um, I mean, I know we're getting there, but I think it also brings you into a mindset that you sort of realize that this stuff is still going to be put together right by, by people with tools. I mean, we're still not in a realm where this is just machines that can go in there and do this perfectly. You know, buildings are still made by people with simple tools and they need access and, and actually seeing it and being able to get in there. I mean, just in general, I think BIM has really brought that back to kind of make sure you understand how things go together, come together. Sometimes the sort of plan sectional drawings just abstract that. And I see that still in, in sort of younger architects today, they just draw things kind of perfectly. And I'm like, okay, have you looked at this from every angle? How'd you get in there? How'd you kind of screw that in? Um, you know, and, and sort of, I think that that sort of, the tools kind of help with that too, I, I find. Um, yeah, we see a, a lot of that too, helping with our Enscape helping with that. In, uh, in the design process where they throw it in the Enscape real quick and take a look at it in, in different angles and see what's going on. Yeah, we have it. Um, most of our architects are actually, you know, two, three screens and Revit will be on uh -huh. one and Enscape on the other and they'll just be right. open all the time. And it's, as, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's improved because it's gotten a better rendering engine and things like uh -huh. that. So kind of, you can get some pretty good you know, presentation-like images, but right. here it's mainly still used for just completion of elements, right? The, how do things mm -hmm. come together? You know, I think Revit is one thing, but actually walk the space, kind of look up, you know, look at soffits. Yeah. Um, we've actually had our structural engineer on the Cal Poly project. They used Enscape too. He walked all the mm -hmm. beams. He basically just yeah. walked all the beams and he was like, well, mm -hmm. when I fall through, that means there's a gap. That means I need to fix something. So, um, <laughs> But he used it that way. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's like a structural engineer kind of cool. using Enscape. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Our, that's our uh, plumbing team uses it all the time. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So Dana, I'm going to let you have last thought. Last thoughts. I don't know. It's, it's kind of overwhelming how many technologies thoughts. there are, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure Alex is the first to be able to testify like with everybody in his office using all of these amazing technologies. I mean, just that in itself was just so cool. But I think those videos really allow for just an immersive experience, not only in the design that you create, but also for the user in, in that process, right? And how that immersion really shapes I mean, I know with Smith Group, we do a lot of hospitals and, you know, nurses want to know how long it takes to get to the nurse station and, you know, different things like that, that just really brings it all together, being able to, to see it in that way, rather than a plan, like Alex was saying, right? Who can read a plan when they're in, in the hospital industry or, you know, in the health industry? So, you know, it's really, really well done. I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's right on in terms of, I think, where we probably should be headed, right? It's bring it back to, to people and humans too. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, the sort of wellness aspects of built environments, but also stress environments, healthcare environments where you're, it, it's not about, you know, you're not even gonna perceive this, this pretty color or whatever. You're not in a state of mind to do that. So how do we kind of transport ourselves a little more into that? 
um, and kind of become a little more humanistic about it. So how do we, how do we in essence make digital technology and BIM sort of human um, so that we can relate better um, and actually kind of make, make better buildings, more humanistic, more sustainable buildings ultimately, right? I mean, that would be sort of the, the, the pot of gold at the, at the end of the rainbow. Um, so to, to, to make sure you can immerse yourself in a fully sensory environment in essence. I mean, now it's still visual. Um, I'm trying to find ways to work with our team here to get, you know, facade comfort kind of um, metrics into the VR environment. So we can, you know, we might not be able to experience heat or, but we might be able to experience mm -hmm. glare or start to visualize heat um, and bring that into a submersive environment. So that it's not just a, you know, it's not just a, a pretty diagram and shows kind of different colors, but actually maybe if it's in a 3D environment and it actually shows you sort of, even if it's just visually, but, you know, audibly maybe even too. I mean, you know, we work with people like Arab, they have a sound booth. So we're like, hey, can we combine the two, right? You, you can at least kind of take off a couple of the senses, right? You can get, get your sound in there, you can get your visuals in there, um, you know? So, so I think the next step is to, I, I, I think you're right on, I think just to kind of get more into that exper experience, that, that human aspect of, of how you experience um, just the built environment in general. And Alex. Earth, oh, right? And the Earth. Earth. Yes. You know, the sustainability Earth is good. factor, the you know, the responsibility that we have to take in that in that respect, right? Mm -hmm. Cost or no cost. Yep. Hopefully the manufacturers can keep up with us. <laughs> right. They're actually sometimes even ahead of us, to be honest. I mean, there, you know, there's some that are sometimes uh, ahead of us. Well, Alex, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so and, much for uh, having me. Great stuff. Really neat. Um, if you, if a listener, if you are listening on the podcast, you may want to jump over to YouTube to watch those videos, but we will have links in the show notes as well. So you can watch those videos on your own. Should you not want to go to YouTube and Dana's got a YouTube channel coming up. She uh, threw, it, threw it out there in the world. I do you have any videos yet? No, no content, but <laughs> coming soon, coming, coming soon. soon. Dynamo BIM on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so I will definitely share with the entire world when I create my first video. Absolutely. So get out there and subscribe to her channel. The more subscribers she has without videos, the more likely she might make some content pretty quick. There you go. You know, get the pressure up there. True. Carl, thank you again for all that you do. It's here to be the pretty face. Yeah, do it well. So well. <laughs> Thanks again. We hope, uh, hope you join us soon. Thank you. Thank you.